begin our presentation on self-disclosure with the disclosure. Having been cautioned against reading the slides, Jonathan and I fearfully decided to jettison the PowerPoint altogether. But fear not, you will receive it after the presentation, and it will contain an outline of the general contour of the discussion around self-disclosure in terms of costs, benefits, tactics, and a few legitimate and very good references. In lieu of a more conventional approach, Jonathan and I are going to share our lived experiences, but in an approach that might be described as meta. We are going to disclose on our thoughts and experiences around stigma and self-disclosure on both the personal and professional level. We've engaged in many hours of rich dialogue. Hopefully you'll find this somewhat fruitful. Jonathan? Thanks, Grady. Um, so while reflecting on the topic of self-disclosure, I feel strongly that it is vital for me, as Grady set, uh, stated, to share some of my personal experiences. In this respect, I need to tell you that for the last couple of years, I've been interested in finding a romantic partner. In light of my search while dating, I've been challenged by the dynamic of self-disclosure and the prevalence of stigma. Inevitably, people will curiously inquire, what do you do for work? Often I begin with a general blanket statement about how I work in the mental health field. Inevitably though, they wanna know more. Are you a psychologist or maybe a social worker? So then I reluctantly tell them, no, I'm a peer support specialist. To which the common reply is, what's that? Then comes my dilemma. There seems to be no way of real, really disclosing my role as a peer support specialist without acknowledging in some way my own experience in recovery. What do you mean in recovery, they ask. To which I reply that I have had my own personal challenges with mental health and that I utilize this experience to try to help others. Though there have been a few individuals that have been encouraging and supportive, many times this is essentially the end of the dialogue and our communication often fades away. With all this stated, I'm inclined to believe that I have a tendency to disclose too much information too quickly and end up scaring away a potential match. Regarding self-disclosure, I have found that I need to be particularly sensitive to both the timing and words that I choose to use. If I communicate my diagnosis or my lived experience recovering from alcoholism or psychosis, too often the door of communication just gets shut. So why do I bring this up? All of the peers in FIRST that I work with long to have better social relationships. And most of the peers that I work with in FIRST have communicated their interest in meeting a significant other. Stigma is one of the powerful barriers that restrains us from successfully achieving these goals. For a percentage of us, the deterioration of our mental health may have impaired what, what otherwise would have been our effective social functioning. This impairment may have isolated or inhibited us so much so that it has been years since we were romantically or sometimes even socially involved with others. While certainly my role as a peer support special, specialist is not to play a matchmaker, my peers and I do have discussions regarding our social relationships and aspirations for love. Developing our interpersonal relationships is a vital component to our continued recovery and happiness. At times, the cultural stigma surrounding mental illness has taken on such a powerful force that I've internalized the negative perspectives of society. For example, I begin to think that I'm not lovable, that I'm just too disabled, too socially inept, or too regressed vocationally to be in a relationship. Sadly, these insecurities have occasionally been reinforced when I have taken the risk to self-disclose. Difficult comments have been stated such as, what would our children be like? I don't wanna have crazy kids. Or you're not going to harm my son, are you? Or I think you need to work on your mental health further before you're ready for a relationship. Or I don't think I can see myself taking care of you if you were to have another breakdown. Particularly the comment about children is a difficult one because there is evidence that suggests that my condition is hereditary and it is difficult to refute whether I'd pass on the genetic components. Coupled with both cultural and internalized stigma, 
is also the challenge of integrating the experiences preceding or during psychotic episodes with my, a positive sense of self. In a forum such as this, it would be unwise for me to disclose some of the details of my behavior precipitating my break and the particular thoughts I experienced while psychotic. Needless to say, some of these experiences continue to haunt my day-to-day -day confidence while in, when interacting with others, let alone dating. Last year, I had the opportunity to disclose elements of my personal recovery journey to the ECHO community. During our preparation, I was asked whether I felt comfortable having the recording of my self-disclosure posted on YouTube. After about a week of prayer, reflection, and deliberation with family and friends, I ultimately decided to have the video posted. Though it may sound trite, while discerning whether to publicly disclose my illness, I became more familiar with the positive impact Kevin Love's disclosure, disclosure had made on larger society. Inspired by his example and my own reflections on how my disclosure might benefit others, I have largely decided to be an open book about much of my recovery. While the decision was made, this is not to say that being transparent about my recovery is always easy. Recently, I had the opportunity to discuss elements of my recovery journey with the marketing department at our agency, and I'd be lying if I told you that I wasn't again anxious about the implications my disclosure would make to a wider audience. Even today, in this moment, I wonder, am I disclosing too much? While preparing for this presentation, I read different perspectives regarding the decision and impact of self-disclosure. An article published by SAMHSA reported that while society is impacted by celebrity self-disclosures, stigma is most often reduced by the disclosure of someone in your own community. For me, learning about the experiences of individuals such as John Nash, Daniel Johnston, Ellen Sachs, and Yoyoi Kasama have all bolstered my ability to make peace with my diagnosis and better understand my place in society. Yet, despite this, I need to remember that the, one of the first places I felt like I truly belonged was with my peers at a residential treatment facility for individuals with serious mental illness. While it was not formal peer support, in this setting, I made friends with other individuals with lived experience who had similar life challenges. This experience was a great opportunity for me to learn about a variety of mental health topics. And oftentimes it seemed that my peers with lived experience provided just as similar a benefit as the therapists and doctors. This benefit was provided for me because of their courage to self-disclose. While I feel strongly that I have made much progress in coming to accept my diagnosis and its necessary treatment, unfortunately, I still struggle with a certain sense of being apart from others. Hopefully, this is simply a measure of self-focus, which will ultimately be overcome through continued recovery. Despite my best efforts to find the romantic relationship I hope to have one day, I have yet to be successful in this endeavor. Nevertheless, I am blessed with many friends and supports that, am, that have encouraged my growth. Though I sometimes witness the ugliness of stigma by my self-disclosure, I am not ashamed of my diagnosis. Despite the cultural prejudice surrounding mental illness, I am confident that those of us with lived experience have particular and unique gifts to offer society. Hopefully, through appropriate self-disclosure, we can further dismantle the barrier of stigma and lead the lives we dream to live. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for that sincere and thought provoking uh, set of remarks. Um, to start off by saying I have uh, been fortunate enough to uh, be with a very loving and understanding partner um so what i have to say is uh uh quite different but meaningful and hopefully uh will make make sense um in the fall of 1999 i was at the university of pittsburgh uh, i was the president of the honors college i was probably headed to yale um you know 
quite the, the golden boy. Um, but I was coming back from a trip to Europe, um, exhausted, series of stressors, you know, boom, um, depressive psychotic episode. Nobody caught it. Nobody saw it. I, I had withdrawn from everything. I was, you know, quasi fetal position in my uh, room, like all the time. One professor said I looked like Dostoevsky's The Underground Man and advised me to either smoke a blunt or go to Western Psych. Uh, that summer in Austria, I had watched uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and bawled like the entire time. I was taking a course on madness uh, in ancient and modern times. And um, uh, the year before I had written a essay on uh, suicide as the only uh, way of attaining subjectivity in, in the modern world. Uh, this was how pervasive stigma was, even at a very, very liberal and intelligent uh, institution. And it almost killed me. I attempted suicide when I had to go back home and withdraw from you know, the, the life that I had, had created. Um, and I find myself now uh, here if, after a, the, you know, a recovery that's been up and down and all around, uh, reflecting on you know, what, what, that, what that has meant, that disclosure. I'm wearing a shirt today um, that looks like the Blues Clues guy. Uh, and I'm wearing this shirt because I was featured on the cover of uh, the Stark Mental Health and Recovery Board's magazine, and it had my recovery story in it. And uh, when I first started at Coleman, I went in my first day, and there are stacks of these magazines everywhere. So, you know, workplace disclosure, bam. But that magazine made a difference with people because I would have clients and, and people in the community say, oh man, I read that and I relate to that. You know, they connected to it. But I, I started to think about disclosure and I take words apart and I think dis against and I think closure, you know, like an ending, an ending. And we are peer supporters. And in doing peer support, we utilize lived experience. And in utilizing lived experience, we are in recovery. And in recovery, we are recovering from something. And that something is pathological. So there's always a sense in which we are disclosing because our very position is based on the fact that we have a mental illness. And it is a mental illness, right? And, and you're constantly in recovery, you're managing it. And, and I, I believe more than anything that peer support is a very, very powerful intervention. I'm, you know, full disclosure again, I'm uh, in a graduate school at Akron now for a master's in social work. I'm doing this consulting. I'm a coordinator for peer support at Coleman. So I'm kind of seeing the managerial level a little productivity concerns and, you know, notes and all of that kind of stuff. I'm a client myself and I'm, I'm doing the peer support. So I'm getting all of these different vantage points. And I'm also finding that the peer support, the power of peer support is not just about that engagement with the client, that rapport. It's also a perspective that relates to the larger conversation that we have with other providers, but it's difficult to have that conversation because whether we like it or not, there still is that stigma, that internal mark that we carry with us on the outside because of our vocation. So, and at Coleman and here, it's been great. You know, I'm not saying that I've experienced this, but it is there. And what I wanted to do for this presentation initially was I had a, a, a stages model of peer support uh, that kind of, and my intention was like to, to objectively ground what we do so that we could show people that, you know, there is, there is something, you know, to this that is more than just our subjective use of, of, of the self, but it becomes difficult because it's confined to this idea, you are a peer support because you have lived experience and you are in recovery. And the way I'm working in graduate school and the way I'm doing this, and I, I'm, I'm working with people and I'm having ideas. I, I had an insurance audit, like a clinical review for a client that I had to, I had to do. 
and I was able to link peer support to modalities that worked, because, and I think it's valuable. So I'm reconciling all of this and trying to, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, maybe that disclosure is essential to the the power of of this intervention. Maybe maybe getting a license isn't isn't the best way to to affect change and and to do this, but that to do that, that, that stigma is going to stay. So it's, it's a very interesting question that I haven't fleshed out right now. Um, but I think what we do get as peers, the one thing that we do bring to the table is a sense of urgency and empathy that, that is really intense just because of the lived experience, because we've been there. Um, and, and that, that can be, be really effective. So um, at the end of the day, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a, a question of we occupy many different roles. And, you know, in, in those roles, because of that, you know, the question of disclosure becomes, becomes more complex. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, for, for SAMHSA, it's a great thing for everyone to disclose on the collective level of public health and, you know, treatment and all that. But for the peer support specialist, it's, not necessarily the case. And I think back to my providers when I first got sick, they said, oh, it's just like diabetes, mental health, you know, or, oh, your brain needs to rest like a broken leg. And I think, what do we want for our clients? Do we want them to learn to manage their illnesses and then simply go on to pursue a life? Or do we want some concept of a more complex recovery that makes that mental illness part of the identity? Um, and I sometimes wonder if we're not we're not clear on that. So I don't know if that if that makes any sense there, but that's uh, that's what I've got. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that was somewhat interesting. <laughs>